Welcome to the Wednesday, September 7th, September 7th, 2022 hybrid meeting of the Thurston County Planning Commission. The Thurston County Planning Commission is a citizen's advisory committee to the Board of County Commissioners on land use planning matters, such as the comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance amendments. Planning Commission actions are in the form of recommendations to the County Commissioners who are the final decision makers. All Planning Commission meetings are open to the public. Citizens are welcome to observe all Planning Commission briefings and work sessions. Public comment is allowed on those topics for which a public hearing has not been heard. My name is Eric Casino, I'm the season's chair of the Planning Commission and I reside in District 2. With that, we'll start out with uh, introductions. And uh, is Commissioner Pessinger online? We'll start with you, Commissioner. Kevin Pessinger, District 1. Joel Hansen, District 3. Uh, Jim Simmons, District 3. Helen Waitley, District 1. Scott Nelson, District 3. Doug Garman, District 2. Mary Halverson, District 2. Thank you very much. And with that, has everybody had a chance to look over the agenda for this evening? And if so, I entertain a motion. Move we'll move something. I'll second. The uh, agenda has been moved and seconded. Uh, call for the vote. Commissioner Pessinger. Aye. Mr. Hanson. Aye. Mr. Aye. Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Mr. Carmen? Aye. Mr. Carlson? Aye. Mr. Casino? Aye. The agenda has been approved. Has everybody had a chance to look over the meeting minutes? Uh, go into, is there anybody discussion on the meeting minutes? Anything that needs to be changed or worked over? Great. With that, um, I'd entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes and accept the audio as the official meeting record. Second. The uh, meeting minutes or the uh, motion is to accept the meeting minutes for August 17th, 2022 and accept the audio as the official meeting record. Call for the vote. Commissioner Pessinger. Aye. Commissioner Nielsen. Abstain. Commissioner Simmons. Aye. Commissioner Wheatley. Aye. Commissioner Nelson. Aye. Commissioner Carmen. Aye. Commissioner Halverson. Aye. Commissioner Casino. Aye. The minutes have been accepted. With that, we'll move on to the public communication portion of our meeting. Uh, those participating via Zoom, please choose the raise your hand option if you wish to address the Planning Commission. You'll be promoted to a panelist when, you're, when it is your turn to speak and be seen. To be seen, please turn on your camera. If you are dialing in, press star nine to raise your hand. Make sure you also choose the star six to unmute yourself. A three minute timer will show on one of the video screens to help you keep track. And with that, we'll start out with Mrs. Seppinen. Oh, did we lose her? Oh, there she is. Loretta, go ahead. Hello, thank you. Um, um, I'm speaking here tonight about your second item on the agenda, the Grand Mound uh, sub-area plan. I um, want to suggest that you might have the tail uh, wagging this dog, uh, the tail being the landowner uh, requests to rezone, which you have a number of that you, you, you do need to deal with. But the dog is really the community vision for what happens. And that's uh, very important to get clarified and is not very clear in this document. And uh, importantly, because this is a UGA, the economic development plan. And that's what I wanna talk about is two items related to economic development. And the first of which is the Chehalis tribe. Uh, the tribe is a key economic uh, player in Southwest Thurston County. It is probably the uh, biggest by a long shot in the uh, immediate area with 1,500 employees. Um, the income from the tribing tribes enterprises is not lining the pockets of some faraway developer. All that money gets reinvested by uh, either tribal services provided or in its own enterprises. And in so doing, it becomes part of an economic engine for the area. 
I urge you before you um, move very far on this plan, that is before the next time you meet, that you need on the plan, uh, you need to have engage in a government to government level um, arrangement with the Chehalis tribe. My second recommendation is about the agricultural neighbors. Now, uh, right in the UGA, there are little or maybe no farms at all, but it, it is, it's an area because the UGA has commercial, industrial, uh, and industrial zones, it's able to provide services that you can't have in the rural area. And it turns out the rural area here is very much an agricultural area. You take a 15 mile radius around um, the growth, um, the UGA of Grand Mound, and it is mostly agricultural land. In fact, about 20% of all of the farmland in the county is right in that 15 mile radius. And it's some of the best land in the county. You might recall um, some editorials that Stephen Bramwell, the Thurston County WSU Extension Director, wrote about two or three years ago in the Olympia, Olympia. And uh, he talked about the need to rebuild agricultural infrastructure, stuff like um, cold and dry storage and value-added processing. The logical place for that rebuilding for the agriculture that's in that part of the county is in Grand Mound. So I urge you before you move very far ahead here is to work with Stephen Bramwell to get the details of what kind of industrial land needs there are for the Grand Mound area to serve its immediate um, uh, agricultural neighbors. And I hope there'll be more opportunities for the community uh, to uh, weigh in um, on their vision for the local community as well. Uh, contemporary, up-to-date information about the vision and up-to-date connection with the tribe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else online that would like to address the Planning Commission? Not seeing anybody, we'll move to the boardroom and we have um, Ryan Deskin. Yeah, we'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you for taking your time to hear us. I am Ryan Deskins. I live at 19331 Old Highway 99 Southwest, right off I-5 on and right outside of Grand Mound. And we are here to see if you guys would be so kind to put us in the UGA. And we have some of that farm ground that she was talking about, but we're 1,000 feet off of I-5 exit, 1,000 feet from the exit. And uh, this started, I came in contact with the property in 2015. I represented the, the current, the owner then, and he'd been working on it for some time to do stuff with it, uh, including agriculture. Um, it was a dairy farm at one time, no longer a dairy farm. And uh, it became apparent that the zoning wasn't gonna work for what it was designed for. Uh, it's very high traffic, noisy area. All the trucks are breaking, jaking to the stop signs in front of our farm and stuff. It's very, you can't even talk on your farm outside. Like when you go out by the fence, you can't talk on your farm. You gotta just wait. Call them back when you get away from the road, right? We're right next to I-5 and 99 and Highway 12. So, so in 2016, we started talking to people, uh, county commissioners and such about what to do. And this is 2016. So we made an official uh, variance permit request in 2017. The county called us back and said, listen, we're already doing this Grand Mountain subplot area thing. We're gonna have it wrapped up by 2018, 19 at the latest. And uh, why don't you guys just mothball that and come in with us because we're going to help you out. And so we did. And we mothballed it. The county sent back the check. And they sent us the, the guidelines and said, here's the, here's the timelines. Here's when we'll have it. And it says right here, it'll be final. You know, these are some of the original documents. That three ring binder is the history of me working on this project since 2016. And so uh, we, we submitted for... To be, to be included in the consideration of being put in the UGA. And partially because of our, all of our neighbors are commercial, uh, commercial except for you know my house, but everything else is commercial around me. There's uh, the truck wash, modern machinery, trucking company, uh, marijuana farm across the street, uh, air, arterial commercial across. So in 2000, uh, 
one of the things, I don't know if I need to muddy the waters, but one parcel got left out of our, we only, we have five tax parcels. We only requested three to be put in and one parcel got left out. And so we've been trying to rectify that, but uh, it's the parcels that are all alongside the road right near the interstate. And I can provide a map if anyone would like to see the map, very simple map. But uh, um, with that said, really what's, what's going on is we try to go through this process. And I think even back then they said, hey, Grand Mound's important, but then they split off Rochester and they did Rochester and they did the main street in Rochester and everything. We just got kind of got put on the back burner. So basically, especially since 2017, we've just been waiting. The current, the past owner said, hey, listen, I'm going to die. I'm 76 years old. I want to spend some time with my kids. I've been doing this since 2006. You buy it and take, over, take the mantle and carry on. So we did purchase the property from him last year in 2021. He moved to Texas with his kids. And uh, we carry on the fight, you know. I don't know if it's a fight. We're working together. We're trying to see a vision that works for everybody. And um, so that's where we're at. I th I'm confident. I, I feel good with county commissioners of all I've met with all uh, some of the other members. I think I think we're on the right track. One last thing I would say, and kind of in regards to some of the other statements, is I also have a business in Grand Mound, uh, Northward. Really, we're in a strip mall right in Grand Mound, across from Starbucks and Key Bank and all the fast food places. Right, and the only people building in Grand Mound is the Shadows Drive. We have a very, very good working relationship with Shayless Tribe. We represent some of their members, high uh, managers and stuff, in real estate transactions and stuff. We have a good, good working relationship with Shayless Tribe. But the Shayless Tribe is the only thing going on in Grand Mount. And it's really apparent. We're finally breaking ground on something new, uh, which is amazing, but it's not the Shayless Tribe, which is good. And the one little fact that no one talks about is the tribe doesn't pay taxes. So now we have a community driven by the tribe major employer, major enterprise, major everything, but we don't have the support that you would normally have with all those enterprises. You know, that's the reason we don't have the other services that we, that other communities have. That's the reason we, we're in some of the situations we are. And I'm just saying that we need to work with the state tribe, but we also need to have some other growth and development. They have bought all the land in front of my office, next to I-5, they bought all the land where we're, we're, we're Used to be the trailer sales place and all that stuff. I don't know where we're at time, but and so it's it's a major concern. If you talk to any business owner and community member down there, they know it. Right? For our schools, for our communities, for our fire departments, for our police departments, it's important. So this decision is not just about my land, it's about the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else in the boardroom that would like to address us this evening? All right. Well, with that. We'll move on to our next item, uh, which would be the emergency housing ordinance. Leah Davis. Good evening, commissioners. Leah Davis with Community Planning. Um, and thank you for attending the final session of the emergency housing ordinance. Uh, you all remember we had two work sessions, one on July 6th and one on July 20th. We also held a public hearing August 17th. There were no comments received from the public. So the next steps for tonight are that we will review the amendments proposed at the post-hearing discussion, and then staff requests a recommendation to the board of commissioners tonight. Next slide, please. You may recall that there were five points that the commissioners asked staff to work on in that discussion. <laughs> And you may have noticed on your copy that staff changed the draft ordinance for the first two points. That is, a public information meeting will be required instead of being waivable, and a cap on the maximum number of residents in any encampment to a 100% increase. There were three other points of discussion raised. That would be alcohol and drugs, weapons, and liability insurance. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can you can you go back to the, the cap on the residents? It, it just sounded confusing to me. Okay, there, what we added was a cap on the maximum number of residents to an increase of 100%. And that's waivable under an emergency. So if, if a piece of land could accommodate 20 homeless campers, we could under certain conditions and approved by the director waive that to increase it up to 40. And that, so we put a cap on the number of residents. 
and it, there was no cap under the wave pool requirement for her. Okay. Um, so there were three other areas of discussion uh, that we did some work on, alcohol and drugs, weapons and liability insurance. And so tonight I would like to discuss and come to a decision on each of those three points before we move on to the next point that will make it more efficient and maybe easier to follow. Next slide, please. So currently, alcohol and illegal drugs are prohibited. The prosecuting attorney's office recommends against um, making that change and making that discretionary. But if the commission still wants to change shall to may, staff has provided that language here. And we could have a discussion now. Does anybody want to go ahead? I, yeah, I'd like to know what the attorney actually said. Why, why, what's, why, what's his opinion based on? The um, only thing that he added was that if you want to keep drugs and alcohol as an option for people, illegal drugs and alcohol, that he recommends that they should be prohibited in um, public and community areas like they would be anywhere in public or community areas, in an RV, in a tent. That was the only added comment he made. He thinks they should be prohibited. But there was some discussion that maybe that should be uh, up to the, you know, the sponsoring agency. But if, there, if it's in the emergency resolution, say it's prohibited, then that assumption is that it's prohibited in the tent and in the RV too. Yes, but harder to regulate probably. Oh yeah, very hard. Yeah, but if you're going to allow it, maybe make the restriction that it not be allowed in public or community areas. Yeah, like, like in. Go ahead. Oh, um, well, what you just said sounds preferable to me. Um, to so that's all okay if anybody so, wants to elaborate on that um, oh that public areas only to uh, public yeah the, private, the, private areas. yeah private areas that may be allowed yeah thank you that 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 sounds like a good solution to me so allow illegal drug use and alcohol use in private areas but prohibit them in community and public areas that's what you say makes sense to you. Which is, that's the recommendation from the PA. If you're going to allow it, uh -huh. at least put that restriction on it. Right. Commissioner Simmons, you had more? I, I guess I kind of go, uh, I mean, it's not allowed in my neighborhood. Why should it be allowed here? I think the idea here is that we have to keep these low barriers so people will actually use them. Uh, is, is the point. And I understand, I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I understand the yeah. point that low barriers help these things actually get utilized. Uh, Commissioner Hansen, you had something? Well, uh, my question is, is there a, a distinction between allowing and the absence of a prohibition? Well, the prohibition could still come from the operator. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but in, in terms of the language, I you know, I I think there's a people would would I think quite rightly have a hang up about the idea of what well, we allow uh, illegal drugs. But if we just don't prohibit them in private areas, I think there's it, it's I'm wondering if there's a distinction there, if there if that no, is functionally the same thing or if 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 it's different in some way. Can I chime in? Sorry, Easy. hard to, hard to chime in virtually. <laughs> um, Part of there's two pieces going on here. One is an enforcement piece. Uh, so we are required to enforce our code and enforcing um, certain strictures on uh, prohibiting in private areas can be difficult. Uh, however, I think part of part of this concern with making this discretionary, uh, if we change the language from shall to may, it is up to the operator on whether or not they would like to prohibit these items. And what we could see in uh, if we had several of these encampments pop up across the county that are permitted, some operators may choose to prohibit, whereas others may not, and that could create a discrepancy in uh, where folks are going to enter into an encampment. Um, so I just wanted to add that in there. Go ahead. Um, we really haven't defined illegal drugs. Scott pointed out that last time, with illegal federally or illegally in 
in the state, but I'm not sure that we ought to allow illegal drugs. I think the whole idea of illegal would be limited to what the county would actually enforce as illegal. If the, since this is a county code, it'd be what the county says illegal, so what the sheriff would call it illegal. Okay, so I guess what I'm saying is that I'm not I'm not in favor of allowing illegal drugs. I'm a, I'm in favor of allowing legal drugs and alcohol, both of which are, do a lot of the same things, um, but not. Okay, Commissioner Elson, you have something? Well, I went back and looked at the comments to the county commissioners on the interim ordinances, and in all the hearings that they've had all the comments they've received nobody mentioned allowing drugs nobody's asked for it as well nobody yeah no no comment that i saw that said this not having not letting people use drugs in these facilities is a barrier okay you know it was all kind of basic stuff and i think i agree i don't i'm not for i mean i don't really care if people drink i mean i think it's probably a liability for whoever's Hosting this, this, but you know, I think until we have evidence that allowing heroin and meth is keeping people out, I mean, I don't know why we should allow it. Mr. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, I was just going to remind us that um, it was um, Commissioner Day who brought this up, and he drew a really. Uh, Hard line. Hard line on it. Yeah, exactly. Um, he said he couldn't support it without this because of uh, what you said, that it creates too high a barrier potentially. That's in the hands of whoever is making this agreement to decide. I think that's what this language is trying to get at. It sounds like the complicating factor, if we were to go this way and not keep the original language, is the suggestion um, that there be some added language about um, that it cannot be in open use in, in sorry open use in open yeah however you want to put it um, which would require an extra sentence i guess is how you fix that but um it seems i guess my my position on this is that this is one of those discretionary things it's about an emergency ordinance uh, it's likely that if the uh, landowner feels like there's a problem, that there's going to be a problem, they will go ahead and prohibit alcohol and or illegal drugs. Um, but that uh, that's their discretion. I, I think that to further on the point that Commissioner Lee was trained, had made before was that the person that would be using these illegal drugs, they're, prop, they're already homeless. And they would be homeless in an unsanctioned camp somewhere. So by keeping this a low barrier, you would then have them into a sanctioned camp where you'd actually have a higher chance of keeping an eye on what's going on. Um, and the, the camp would then be equalized. So I, I understand Commissioner Day's point very well, even though I'm not really hip on the idea of Whole bunch of people doing heroin on the side of the road. But, but I think if they're going to be doing heroin on the side of the road, anyways, we want to do it in a spot that we can see and help, or do we want them doing it in a spot where there is nobody that has any oversight on anything? It's kind of the idea. Does anybody else have? Commissioner Pestinger, did you have something? No, I think we're splitting hairs here, but. Uh... But marijuana usage, in my mind, is far less dangerous than alcohol usage, and I'm, I'll stick with that. I, I I honestly don't think that marijuana would count as an illegal drug in the way that this is being written. Go ahead, I guess I don't see how we can allow the use of illegal drugs. I mean, by stating it in this document, I'm kind of, I, it's illegal. I mean, I'd say it's illegal for us to to allow it. I mean, we're complicit, complicit in, in so I, I mean, I, I object to the use of the word illegal. It's to differentiate between uh, prescription drugs and illicit drugs, because originally there was a ban on all drugs, and then we realized well that can't be. Yeah. So 
we defined it. Yeah. I guess I would leave it out because it's assumed you can't use illegal drugs. Why? I get where you're going. I just I don't see how that would work. But I'm surprised that it's okay to use. Go ahead, Mr. But this is the problem here that we're changing the language. I mean, we have the language, and this is kind of an emergency, uh, you know, change. And that's why you have to address this issue. I mean, we can't just sort of leave it out because, you know, what what you're saying is we exchange it for the, this emergent for emergency purposes. Yeah. So that's why it has to be in there somehow. And you're saying, well, the way you know the easiest way to make the distinction is to just call it illegal drugs. Uh, to distinguish it from, well, alcohol is already there. Um, you know, you don't want to add a, a long list of other potential mood altering substances or whatever um, that are not illegal. So, I mean, this seems like the most elegant solution to me. Um, and it has to, I mean, I understand, I think, that it has to be there because it's changing the language, um, you know, that, that usually is there. Commissioner Carmen, I heard you say something at the end, and I wanted to clarify. The county attorney says, do not lift the prohibition. Keep it as it is. Because I, I thought he said that. He said, prohibit them. He wants to yeah. prohibit, yeah. But, but if we want to allow but his it, first recommendation is, is don't change it. Yeah. yeah. But, he, but he didn't take out the word illegal. That's why. That's why. I see what you're saying. Okay. Have it. Having just heard that, I I'm totally I'm I'm on board with not. You know, I just don't want the idea of that the county is saying it's okay to have illegal drugs in these camps. Fair. And and you know, so if it's prohibited, if illegal drugs are, are prohibited and it's in this writing, I'm fine with that because you know, alcohol and marijuana. I I mean, God, I smell that stuff everywhere. So. But, so you want to go with the attorney's first recommendation? Prohibiting illegal drugs. I, I think so. I don't want, I, again, I don't want to get the impression that we're saying it's okay to be in these camps and do this. Right. Do we do we take a vote on these individually? Is that how you want to do that? If, you, if that is the, that's how. If it's would that make your life easier if we went through this one? It would one be clearer, probably, be clearer. the record, yeah. Okay, with that, can we... I would entertain a motion on this particular issue. Okay. I would move that we break it into two points. One would be prohibiting illegal drugs. And the other would be may, may prohibit alcohol, other illegal drugs. And should offer a good fighting. Well, that would be at the discretion of the operator, anyways, whether or not you allow that. Oh, right now, it says you shall. No, you shall. It's prohibited here under the current words. We're, we're talking about changing. So, your name. motion is, is the PAO's second version or second best recommendation. I'd say we and shall prohibit illegal drugs. And then you can you write a name or prohibit alcohol and may and may prohibit alcohol. That, that is his second. That was his second choice. He didn't go into that much detail. He said shall or may or both. Well, in, in this quoted line here it says may prohibit al alcohol and illegal illegal. Oh, okay. So you want to put the uh, may so, prohibit alcohol. Shell, shell, illegal drug, prohibit drugs. Well, it'd be the other way around, though. To be, I mean, so you, you'd say sh you, you put the may prohibit alcohol to be so, behind drugs. Right. That's right. what you'd do. So you shall prohibit alcohol and illegal drugs, and then move the may and may prohibit uh, fighting alcohol. All right, well, okay, wherever it is, the shall, the shall has to come first. <laughs> With the illegal drugs. Not that, not that I support is it. There, anyway, is there a second to that Commissioner Carmen's motion? Second. Okay, the motion is to change the wording to shall prohibit illegal drugs 
and fighting, but may prohibit alcohol. You can, you can add legal drugs if you want. I don't want to add that. Okay, I'm just confused. There. Does everybody understand the motion? You, yeah. you understand the motion? I understand the motion. <laughs> Maya, Maya, do you understand the motion? Shall prohibit illegal drugs and fighting and may prohibit alcohol. Oh, uh, the fighting was um, not, I don't think he checked in. I don't think. I don't know if there's any way. I think that was under the may, uh, under the proposed. No, fighting has never been allowed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. There's, there's, there's the and shell. Yeah. Okay, I got it. With, with okay. that, let's call for the vote got on it. that motion. Okay. Mr. Faxinger? Nay. Mr. Nay. Commissioner Simmons? Aye. Commissioner Wheatley? Nay. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Carmen? Aye. Commissioner Halverson? Aye. Commissioner Casino? Aye. That motion passes five to three. Uh, shall prohibit illegal drugs and fighting and may prohibit alcohol. Yes. Okay, so now to our next one. Okay, the next one. Uh, this to, has to do with weapons. Uh, the county prosecuting attorney's office recommends against a requirement for safe storage of weapons. Requiring guests to use safe storage could be seen as a violation of the Second Amendment. In addition, this requirement could be cost prohibitive for something that residents may not use if it is optional. Next slide, please. If the commission would like to move forward with the requirement for safe storage of weapons, staff has provided the language here. So let's discuss that. Mr. Chair. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Wheatley. Um, I actually had a question. Uh, we kind of breezed past, and I thought we talked about this, this whole question about prohibition of weapons. It says um, the county PAO rec recommends against prohibition on weapons. Not that, that's just a recommendation. So that seems like that's on the table. Um, and that was something that was in the previous, you know, the thing that we just voted on um, may, it was proposed to have language saying may prohibit weapons. I would like to bring that back in uh, I, you know, it kind of got breezed past here as if just because the PAO recommended it, then it's not going to happen. But I, I would like to see the ability to uh, have the discretion to prohibit weapons brought back in. I, I would say that's not really up for discussion because it's been determined that it, uh, it's a violation of the Second Amendment. The DOCC is already determined that. Yeah, the so the, there is no prohibition of weapon. We're talking about whether we're going to require a place to safely uh -huh. and securely store weapons. That's the only thing on the table tonight. Go ahead, Commissioner. Well, as I understand it, we can't prohibit them from having weapons because of the Constitution, but the sponsor should be able to. They can, I, they can limit. Yeah, that wasn't, their that wasn't our question to the prosecuting attorney. So, I mean, I, I want to tell him that we, we should say may. So we so it's pointed out, we're talking about. Well, I mean, is, the BOCC says we can't do it, but there's nothing in this code that would say that we have to enable the operator to be able to do it. That, that rule's not put on. We didn't, this won't put a rule on the operator on whether or not they can put back in their rules. Yeah, I that's think correct. Shall prohibit alcohol. No, we don't, well, I guess we change that. Yeah. yeah, we would ch change all that. But I mean, if we don't, if we don't, I, well, I, yeah, I guess there's no mention of weapons other than safe storage. Yeah. So it would be. So the county would not have a position on whether or not they have weapons. Yeah. It would be up to the <laughs> operator. The, what's on the table tonight is whether or not we're going to require operators to have state, safe storage facilities. I mean, I would recommend that uh, safe storage is recommended to be provided for weapons on the property. You like leaving it as recommended? Is recommended. 
Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I, I, I don't think it's going to be required because yeah. I mean, first of all, I don't know where you're going to get safe storage. Yeah, I think you know, we, I think we had that discussion last we, time. Yeah. Um, and secondly, if I if I am in a position where I feel that I need that, I don't want it in the office a hundred yards away. Yeah, no. I need it here. If you know, not like somebody's going to break into my tent or little shack that I have, and I can say, well, wait a minute, let me go get my weapon. So, I mean, that's by that time, it's too late. Commissioner Hansen, did you have something? Uh, I'm in agreement. All right, Commissioner Pessinger, did you have anything on this issue? I'm in agreement, but I see it as uh, the opportunity for the place that's providing this or to provide storage. I mean, what happens when the person leaves and can't carry the weapon with them? Oh um, they don't want to leave it laying around. The option to have safe storage is a good option. The, it's There's no prohibition on the option. We, we're debating whether we're going to require safe storage. Or make it recommended. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like recommend it if I wasn't clear. We see a whole lot of recommending. Okay, well, I entertain a motion on leaving safe storage at a recommendation level for make, the operator. I make a motion that we include language safe storage is recommended to be provided for weapons on the property. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All right, Commissioner Passenger. Aye. Commissioner Hansen. Aye. Commissioner Kelly? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Carmen? Aye. Commissioner Helverson? Aye. Commissioner Casino? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. All right. The final point that we're talking about tonight uh, currently, the requirement for general liability insurance is waivable in an emergency. The county prosecuting attorney's office recommends that the director consult with county risk management about waiving or modifying this requirement on a case-by-case -case basis. Staff has provided the language here. So let's discuss that. I like the, I like the recommendation that they consult with risk management prior to making the decision. Yeah, that seems really reasonable to me. Does I he, agree. Does anybody have other comments on this? So I would make a motion that we take the yeah, language and the waiver or modification of Thurston County Code 20.35.090, some paragraph 12, also requires concurrence from Thurston County Risk Management in addition to the other requirements necessary for a waiver under this section. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the PAO's recommendation. Call for the vote. Commissioner Pessinger. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Hansen? Aye. Commissioner Simmons? Aye. Commissioner Wheatley? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Carmen? Aye. Commissioner Halverson? Aye. Commissioner Casino? Aye. That motion passes 7-1. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so the next slide. Okay. Yeah. So if there are no further questions or points, no, discuss, no points. then we do have a motion to make a recommendation to the commission if anyone would like to do that. We'd entertain that motion as a moment. You wanted to make it? I move to recommend approval of the development of the project item 824 emergency housing ordinance, permitting criteria flexibility, which amends the homeless encampment administrative procedures chapter within Title 20, 21, 22, and 23 to allow for a waiver of some way. The waiver of some permitting criteria for homeless encampments during the declared emergency will clarify application of permitting procedures for homeless encampments. <laughs> Second. The, mo the motion has been made, and to repeat the motion, move, has been moved to recommend the approval of development code docket item 824 emergency housing ordinance permitting criteria flexibility, which amends the homeless encampment and administrative procedures chapters within title 2021. 20, 22 and 23 to allow for the waiver of some permitting criteria on homeless encampments during a declared emergency and clarified applications and permitting procedures for homeless encampments. Call for the vote. All right. I, I, just a, oh. I, just a, a go ahead. Thing. I just want to make sure now this goes to the board and it'll go to the public hearing and all that. 
so the public will have an opportunity to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Call for the vote. All right. Commissioner Passenger. Nay. Commissioner Hansen. Aye. Commissioner Simmons. Aye. Commissioner Wheatley. Aye. Commissioner Nelson. Aye. Commissioner Carmen. Aye. Commissioner Halverson. Aye. Commissioner Casino. Aye. That motion passes seven to one. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis. Thank you, commissioners, and thank you for your community service. All right. Well, with that, we will be moving on to um, some new business, item number five on our agenda, the work session on the Grand Mountain sub area plan with uh, Caitlin Nelson. Oh no, okay, hang on guys, technical difficulty. All right, <clears throat> which one do you want, the PowerPoint? Yes. Make it into the point. Commissioner Pessinger, we might lose you on the screen. So if you have something, would you please just jump in? Sure. Thank you. All right. Before we get started, uh, I did want to introduce one of our newest associate planners, Amelia Schwartz. She comes to us from Chehalis. Um, she's got some great background in planning and current planning, so not just long-range planning, but she's actually issued permits. So <laughs> uh, Amelia will be helping Kate um, with a lot of the development code pieces of the Grand Mound, and then you'll see her on a couple of, um, of our additional projects in the future. Do you want to drag here? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, planning commissioners. I am Kate Nelson. Okay. Um, hey, please hold questions. Keep going. But I got. I got to fix this. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> uh, please hold your questions till the end, including after Amelia has done her part of the presentation. Um, also, just as a note, there have been some small changes um, and rearranging of the PowerPoint, so it'll just have a few differences if you have a printed out copy. Uh. <laughs> The Grand Mount Subarea Plan uh, is on the 2022 to 2023 comprehensive plan amendment docket uh, as item CPA4, uh, and it is the board's number one priority out of nine docketed amendments. There were three open houses held in 2018, one in the spring of 2020. Um, here on, it's not being shared. So. There you go. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, turn that TV so that they can see it because we can see this one over here. And that one down there. It does. Mm -hmm. okay. so you're going to get big trouble. It's going to fall <laughs> on the wall. Oof. Okay. I want to keep going in the meantime. Yeah. I have a problem. I can see that. Uh, okay, included in this update uh, are the repeal and replace of the 1996 Grand Mound Subarea Plan, uh, as well as the consideration of eight site specific land use and rezoning proposals, uh, and updates to the Thurston County Code, including moving design standards uh, for Grand Mound into the code. Um, they currently exist in the subarea plan, so they're not very easy for staff to find. Um, and some proposed reductions to the minimum lot widths within these res residential zoning districts. The sub area plan specifically guides growth within the urban growth area. Um, and as is in the name, um, they are areas designated for more urban types of development. Grand Mount allows for more industrial and commercial types of uses in the surrounding areas like Rochester. Uh, and there are 
some differences in this map created by TRPC in how we categorize land uses, uh, but you can get a general idea of the land use types from it. The plan looks at growth over a 20 year planning period uh, and acts as a mini comprehensive plan, which allows for amendments once a year. Uh, we made updates to the plan specific to the Grand Mound area because we would want to repeat information that is located within our county comprehensive plan. Uh, and generally around things that include land use, population forecasts, goals and policies, and that sort of thing. Some of those updates are from the Thurston Regional Planning Council Buildable Lands Report. Um, they are forecasting that the population in Grand Mound will double by 2045 from 2020. Um, and they're also forecasting an excess capacity of 22% um, of housing units based on current zoning. And this is a good thing. Um, a healthy percentage is between 18 and 25%. There are eight land use and rezoning proposals, as I mentioned before. Three of those requests are also requesting an expansion to the UGA. Uh, these requests must be consistent with countywide planning policies, comp, uh, comp plan policies, and state law. Properties that are also requesting an expansion to the UGA have specific additional policies uh, that they must meet and provide reasoning for. These proposals must also go to a UGA review board, uh, and that board can provide a different recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners from what the Planning Commission provides. The total amendment uh, acreage requested is 241 acres, and you received this map as attachment C in your materials. Your approval or denial of these land use requests and UGA expansions do not have to be all or nothing. Um, they would be reviewed for their individual consistency with the applicable policies that they need to be reviewed for. Uh, I went through that pretty quickly, but. Um, we will go back to questions uh, after Amelia has finished her um, part of the presentation on the code amendments. Hello, I will not speak near as efficiently and quickly as Caitlin. <laughs> um, so I apologize for a little slow. Uh, but we, like you said, we will hold questions until the end in the interest of time. And I'll try to speak fast enough so I'm also keeping track of it. All right. So the code amendments that we're going to be looking at are for lot widths and then the development slash design guidelines. So we'll start with lot widths. Okay. So the existing minimum lot widths in the Grand Mount area are larger than other similar areas within County. And that has apparently made it difficult to do subdivisions, buy land, and develop it because they're having to maintain a minimum lot width that is larger than, let's say, the average. By minimum, you're talking about one acre versus five acres versus no. uh, 20 feet versus 120. So, like, <laughs> not quite that range of things. There's two different lot types there. But yeah, in feet. Okay. Um, and it's only for two different zone types, and we'll show those in a moment. So the general concerns are the lot width size and then all the different lot types we have in that uh, lot width. This part is in the code. So concerns, are they too large? What widths would actually be helpful? But well, what size can we keep to maintain that rural character and not turn it into you know, a subdivision in urban Olympia? And then we want to look at the lot types and see how they're broken down. If we like that, we want to change them. All right. So the only zones impacted with this, oh, yeah, I'm trying to do them both. All right. With this code amendment, are only two different residential types: it's the R three to six and the R four six to nine. So this won't change their usage. It won't change what's going to come in there. It's just changing how we are regulating that minimum lot size. Okay, so this is what we have currently. And your best bet is looking at that screen. It feels a little like an eye appointment. My apologies if there's a lot of information. Uh, so in the 
yellow to blue scale, we have what Grand Mound has existing right now. The left number is for our three to six over one, and the right number is our four to 16 over one. So right now, the minimum lot width for say an interior lot is 75 feet for R3 to 6, 60 feet for R4 to 16. Compare that to the Olympia the standard lot is 50, 45, 40. Um, Lacey and Tom uh, also have 50, 40 is kind of the minimums compared to that 75 to 60. Then you'll also see the difference in lot types where these grand mount lot types, uh, there are nine. Interior, corner, waterfront, cul-de-sac, it goes on. Olympia does standard lot, townhouse, cottage, that's it. Lacey does lot with alley access, lot without alley access, and multifamily info. Tom Water, lot without alley access, lot with alley access. So they're not splitting it into, into those different categories. We do have other categories, uh, zone types, that do split it, but they don't consist of waterfront law. So that's one thing to consider. Yeah. All right. So the proposal you'll have in your documents is keeping most of those lot types, um, but then we would remove waterfront, so just to make that easier, and then we would get those lot minimum width sizes a bit closer to the other UGS in the county. So we're not trying to get it closer to, like I said earlier, urban areas. We're looking at other UGS in the county. How can we get that closer to that, make it a little more standard? So those are that, that's an option. And you'll see that right now in detail and you can actually compare the different charts. All right, we'll go on to design guidelines. So current these are called the development guidelines. And just to clear part of the proposal is also changed the name to design guidelines because they don't actually have guidelines for development necessarily or for design. So this would clarify some things. All right. So the current guidelines are contained with this 18 page document for the grant round scenario plan. Like Kayla mentioned earlier, it's not in the code. So Developers and staff are having to go to external sources to look at what these projects will actually require. So it discusses signs, parking lots, and landscaping standards. And then there's a little image of kind of what one of the pages of it looks like. So the proposal is updated and move it into the code. And so we keep that streamlined. Where do we look for our regulations in the code? So some of the general updates that are in there, the proposed updates, obviously, uh, we are going to be referring back to existing code. So leading it back to what's already regulated. Uh, it's increasing tree species options. So we're not limiting to tree species that maybe aren't the most successful for the area they're in. We're possibly incentivizing the retention of significant or existing trees. Increasing options for design and sense of place. So sense of place is something you can't put. Uh, it's a little hard to capture. But based on some of the community input from the earlier Shepanis development plan, as well as community meetings prior to COVID, uh, a lot of people mentioned wanting to keep it their rural feel, their hometown feel. So it's kind of an attempt to actually get a cohesive sense of place with the design. So. And then removing some language that's not applicable, it's redundant, nobody's enforcing it, taking that out. And then bringing in some policies and uh, recommendations from that Chehalis tribe's grand mount development plan that was done over a decade ago. And then adding in language to improve the pedestrian experience, safety, and access. That's a quick rundown of what you'll be seeing. Uh, and then so the next steps is we've got our next work session on the 21st, and then we'll have an option to schedule a public hearing. Contact info is on the slide. So I'm set up sharing so that we can see everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Well, I know I know that you had a, a lot going on so far. Yeah. I appreciate you setting that up. You're starting to be great. Well, can um, I imagine we're going to be talking about this a lot. So I don't want to, I, I maybe want to pick the low hanging fruit just really quickly. That's um, right. Yeah. And and that would be um, I I had one question on the um, uh, I guess it's the it's not the design guidelines it's the it's the code the lot size and all that and and it's just one really simple question um, I was looking and I'll talk about this at some point but I was looking at census data for um, the three census tracts that are kind of the most important, um, the 2020 census data. Um, and I noticed that uh, in the Rochester tract that this UGA is in, um, there are like 840 uh, mobile home units. And I am really interested in how this UGA can help with, um, you know, uh, medium density housing and low and very low income housing. And so I'm wondering, can you consider um, mobile homes within the UGA? I mean, do any of these categories that, that you put up there, these lot sizes, can they accommodate that if that were to prove to be a, something to consider? Because there are 840 of them in the tract already. So one thing that I do want to clarify first is that the census data boundary does not overlap with the Grand Mill UGA very well. I, so it, it very well could be considering properties that aren't actually in the UGA. Yeah, but I absolutely think that we have to think big. You know, the UGA is not its own thing. It's part, the, the purpose of it is to support um, the South County. You know, it's part of a larger picture and to my mind, we're not really, as a planning commission at least, we're not thinking about it properly if we're only thinking of it in terms of the UGA, but it's what the UGA is there to do. And I see it as being there um, to support uh, the surrounding areas, which is kind of the point that um, uh, one of the public commenters, uh, Loretta, brought up is that, you know, there's a large agricultural community there. Um, there are um, agricultural workers who need housing. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that we can be thinking about that the CUGA could be part of the solution for. Um, and so, I mean, it's, I thought it was a fairly simple question. It's just, yeah. can, you, can you put, if you wanted to, could you put mobile homes in there or something like that? So I'm not sure of the usage for those zones, but with minimum lot widths, if we reduce those lot widths, it does make it cheaper to develop. So developers, whether they're private, whether they're large, they can put more homes in and they, you know, it's going to cost less up front. And so they're not going to have to build the mansion to get a return on their investment. Mm -hmm. So it, by lowering those minimum lot widths, we have more opportunity to bring in middle class housing. Chris, I don't know if I don't I don't know if um this is a question you can answer because I know that you're not on the permitting side, the development side, you're on the planning side. But um it's my understanding that this is a sub area, not a UGA. And as such, it's still unincorporated county. And as such, the regulations for development cannot have a distinction between a mobile home and a stick built home that if a stick built home could be built, a mobile home could be rolled in. Now, maybe I'm understanding that wrong. Oh, you're not, that is correct. Um, so what we do is ensure that policies that are within sub area plan allow for mobile homes to be placed on within those certain zones and they can only go in obviously residential zoning um, and just make sure that the um, zoning that is laid out allows for that. So it wouldn't necessarily be within the lot widths, um, by minimizing our lot widths, we get more lots in a particular area, but the zoning itself, um, the four to six, the four to 16, that's what, um, if there was an area where it could be prohibited, that's where it would be. And we can go back, but you're correct. If we can build a stick built home, we, can, we have to allow for a mobile home to be placed there, so. I, I have a question about, specifically about lot widths. If, 
if we match the lot widths of the sub area, Grand Mound sub area to those of the UGAs, what, that would obviously increase the buildable land utilization rate. And it might go from 22% to something higher. I don't know what it is. Is there, and you said that sweet spot is 18 to 25. If we all of a sudden bumped up over 25% of excess usable lands, is that, is there a ramification to that, a negative ramification to that? Not necessarily. Uh, what we would need to do is go back and look to make sure we have capacity in our infrastructure to allow for that. Um, that's part of this entire sub area plan. The look is to make sure that we have the appropriate infrastructure in those areas so that we can get the water, we can get the, the sewer, the, the roads, those sorts of things there. Oh, that was my question. And Who the provides allowed septic density and water? wouldn't increase. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Who provides septic and water to the Grand Mound area right now? The county. The county yes. Okay. Yeah. And in the future, it's expected, unless they incorporate, that the county will. Yes. So this falls under public works, Tim Wilson, storm and sewer water, Perfect. septic, okay, uh, which they already are having a problem uh, with the septic and water systems in Brad Mound as far as cost. The people, the people that pay for that right now in the Grand Mound area are only paying a small portion of the actual cost that the county is incurring for that septic and water system. That's a fact. So I'm just, I'm interested to know how that, if, if that's not gonna change, then by creating the this area and putting in all these homes and stuff, uh, how, how is that gonna work? Are they going to require HOAs for developments like the cities do? I'm sorry, but if, if I'm building out, out there, I believe I'm incurring the cost of putting in the well or putting in a septic system. No. Well, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to pay for it to get it put in installed. So it's okay. not, I don't, I'm trying to, I, I get what you're saying, Barry, but I'm trying to figure out where the county expense for water and sewage is no. if it's a septic. And that's my well. It's not, because it's not, it's not a well, they it's not, not a, a, a sewer system. So they right. do, okay. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. that's what I'm saying. It, and it, that septic system, that sewer system, that sewer and water system for the Grand Mound area used to be run by the citizens of that area. It used to be an unincorporated water and sewer uh, district, probably. district, yeah. an SUV, that, but they failed. Uh, the expenses got too high and the county had to step in and take over control of the system. Okay. Uh, and you're saying it's undersized. Oh, it's grossly undersized and it's underfunded. And the county has basically ex taken the expense out of general funds to pay for the cost of the system. Go ahead, Commissioner Weasley. I thought I read either here or in the buildable lands report or somewhere that there's a lot of sewer capacity that um, that it's like huge. So what we can do is as public works come in and discuss the capacity for water and sewer in the Grand Mound area, but the policies that you're reviewing in the Samaria plan do impact infrastructure. Well, and I don't know, just be, I mean, if it's true that they're underfunded in the county commissioner, you're sending the money, I don't know that that's our place to make changes because our, our job is to do land use planning. Right. If the commissioners want to continue to fund that, if they're doing that, then that's their choice. If they want to change the rate structure and make it pay for itself, that's their choice. They're doing that too. I, I think these are really two separate issues and that the, the land use planning separate than whether or not the infrastructure is there. Yes. The infrastructure is going to, it, it will catch up or it won't catch up. That's not really the land use planning part. So the discussion about how it's getting paid, that's current, that's that's not part of our, that's outside of our purview. Um, making sure that um, what we're doing as far as the land use plan doesn't um, impose um, extra, that we have the capacity within 
what we've already planned out for the next 20 years uh, is part of our land use review. So we have to do that. Commissioner Hanson. Just this conversation, it, it took me back to the notes I was making during public comment, but um, it occurs to me that it begs the question, what's the greater vision long-term for this area before we get into the weeds of right. doing the, the lot widths and, and things like that. I, um, you mentioned there was some public workshops, but they were years ago for my time here and before the entire world changed. Uh, so is there any uh, interest in doing some public outreach and, and figuring out what is the greater vision before we get down to the details of how we accomplish it? Yeah, Commissioner Wheeling? Yeah, well, just sort of going back to the infrastructure thing, because that's part of it. Um, I mean, uh, A, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's heaps of infrastructure. I mean, what what uh, I what I took away from what I've read from the buildable lands report and from you know all the materials we've been given, and I read the transportation stuff from TRPC, you know, is that uh, the whole point is that this is, you know, the whole point of having one of these is it's a place where you have that, you deliver that infrastructure efficiently, right? And you encourage people to build within those boundaries so that you're being as efficient as possible in delivering that infrastructure. And it looks like Grand Mound is really in good shape. I mean, it's got heaps of land for all the uses, you know, it's like way in excess of uh, you know, the anticipated capacity for industrial needs. It's got tons of land for, you know, all of the things. Um, it's got the infrastructure there. It's got the sewer and, you know, all of that stuff. And the really key piece of infrastructure, transportation, you know, the, the, uh, the um, TRPC right now is like scrib scribbling away on writing, you know, writing up the stuff for putting, you know, they're going to put in those traffic circles you know, the federal government's kicking down money to do that kind of thing. And so it seems like the traffic infrastructure is going to be pretty reasonable, too, and that the planning needs to be around that. And I think that, the you know, one thing that wasn't, you know, maybe it would be helpful for everyone to know that there was that, um, what was it, 1990, the Chehalis tribes put together I, um, you know, yeah, you referred to that, but there is a kind of a visionary uh, plan available, and it seems like the county and TRPC have been working off of that plan already, and it, and it's here, you know, and I think we can add, you know, I would like to add to that by really emphasizing, um, you know, I agree with Loretta that we should bring in the the fact that this is in relation to Rochester and to the ag land there, you know, that that's an important part of this story as well. And it kind of gets left out some, somehow, you know, that that could be better developed. But I think the overall vision is actually there. Um, I'd like us to maybe talk about it and make sure we all understand it. And it would help to maybe read that Chehalis tribes document. Um, but I think, you know, I think this could be fairly easy, you know, once we're kind of all familiar with it. I, I think that one of the things that we have to consider here is that this area is going to probably be the largest development down in that area, and it's going to have a lot of growth. And this is our opportunity to match it more closely to UGA development codes and densities. And I think those kind of development codes and densities will just make it better and more efficient and it will make a transition to incorporation at some time down the road easier and better. And so the closer we can get our sub area plan to match UGA plan or UGAs that we have now, I think the better off that we're going to be and the better off the area will be. But it's certainly open for discussion. Okay, so just jump in really quick. Uh, long story short is yes, we do have capacity for sewer and water within the UGA. Uh, that doesn't include the nitty-gritty nitty -gritty details. Uh, it is in your memo that the 
water system plan and the sewer plan uh, are in the process of being updated with public works currently. Uh, and those will especially address any of the issues over the next 20 year planning period. That uh, also includes the properties um, that we are considering um, in these proposals for expanding the UGA. That is something that we would need to consider is whether or not we would have capacity with those properties. And we do, so that's not something that we need to really focus on. Um, there are other, um, countywide plan is planning policies that we'll look at, uh, and public works uh, can definitely talk more about the details um, of that, but long story short is we do have capacity. Are, are you planning on bringing public works in to talk to us about um, infrastructure then? If you need to have that. Do we need to have public works coming to talk about infrastructure? I don't think we do. I, I'll take your answer's word for it that it's there. Okay. How do you feel about that? Uh, I'll go back and look at the documents I read. Okay, thank you. <laughs> there are some issues uh, there are a lot with, of with issues getting uh, infrastructure to individual homes, but that's a different issue because that is on the property owners. Um, that's why I asked the budget. question. Is the county looking at requiring developers to form HOAs, uh, which takes care of some of your uh, stormwater requirements and lighting and stuff like that? that I know there's going to be impact know. fees. Well, but. so... Uh, as far as the water system and the sewer system plans, I think that those would be addressed during those updates and those are gonna be in the next couple of years. So we're not gonna be able to talk about it at the moment. Um, the other infrastructure issues, um, I said they are work, Public Works is also working on updates to the road standards. So that would also be included in that. So uh, unfortunately, I, I can't give you a lot more information on it at the moment because they're all in progress. I don't know how deep we were going to get into this tonight. Were we going to go through each one of these eight amendment or uh, proposals, or how far in did you want to go? Uh, I think ideally, I would want to be able to answer the main questions that you have right now, and then if you would be able to bring back questions uh, at the on next the individual meeting. project. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's go to Commissioner Wheatley then. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I guess I. Oh, I'm not. On. Okay. <laughs> Um, I guess I really need some clarification here. Uh, is this a UGA or is it not yes. a UGA? Yes, our sub area it plan and our UGA. UGA are the same boundaries. So we're, uh, yes, it is a sub area. It acts as a sub area, but the UGA is what we're going to focus on because it has more regulations, more policies we have to follow. Okay, because in my opinion, I'll just lay it out there right now. Um, my understanding is if you have ample capacity within your UGA, there's no reason to expand the boundaries of your UGA. So is what you're saying that you would like us to consider whether we would like to approve these proposed, you know, consider whether we would approve these proposed amendments uh, when they're requesting expansions of the UGA? Because for me, that's a hard no because there's plenty of capacity within the UGA now. There's more than enough capacity. And the whole point of a UGA is you want to infill it. So, um, so you know, I would really like clarity on, on the intention there because I cannot support expanding the UGA boundaries. It looks, you know, I was trying to understand why the boundaries were drawn the way they were. And it looks to me like there's sort of, if you do kind of like layering, there's sort of environmental reasons, for example, why it's shaped the way it is. Um, there's traffic reasons why it's shaped the way it is. There's reasons why you want to have your middle density housing where it is. And the two of the, two of the um, requests would, you know, completely transform the area that is supposed to be the dense housing area. And so I, you know, I have a little heartburn over that. Um, so I think we do need to consider, you know, there's a reason why they all get sort of put on your desk at the same time. So you can think of the overall impact of all these requested changes. And I see them really changing the UGA rather significantly. And I also see like this unneeded uh, notion of, um, you know, expanding UGA boundaries when the, you know, as was mentioned, you know, part of the problem is even filling in the UGA as we have it now. So, so I, you know, I would really like some clarity about this difference between the plan and the UGA, if they're one in the same or not. 
Yeah, so uh, I have on the screen right now uh, some of the requirements that have to be met uh, to expand a UGA. Uh, it needs to be uh, served by water, sewer, and transportation, and we've talked about that. Uh, urbanization is compatible with resources, um, resource uses in critical areas, and that is generally you know, making sure that we're not including things like wetlands. Um, must be contiguous to existing UGA. All the properties are touching, so it, yes, it meets that. Uh, is required to provide land for growth for the next 20 years. Uh, I think the way that we have looked at it, uh, no, we do not need to expand to accommodate growth. Um, but uh, the other part of it is, is there an overriding public benefit beyond the area proposed for inclusion related to protection, public health, safety, and welfare? Uh, so we would have to provide reasoning for how it would be doing that. Uh, there are other things that can be considered. Uh, two of the properties that are in that R4 zone, one of them is uh, a firehouse that, um, a fire station that uh, is not really being used for residential. There is another property that uh, has some very minor commercial uses. Um, so there, there is no residential property there. Um, so one thing that you could consider is, does it make sense, it's along Highway 99, to make that a commercial spot? Would you want to move R4 to another location? Um, does it make sense, there's, there's a lot of R3 that isn't developed. Um, so an option could be to make that corridor commercial across from the Great Wolf Lodge, and then maybe that wasn't the best place for R4. Um, another property is requesting expansion of the UGA uh, to be R4, so that, could potentially serve as a public benefit if we're removing it somewhere else. So um, there are a couple different things to consider. Um, it, you're right, it is complicated and you do have to have good reasoning for why you're doing it. I do want just to answer your question directly, Commissioner Bailey. The UGA, the Grandma UGA and the Severe plan are one of the same. And to think about it, I would think about it this way is that we're joint planning with ourselves. So it's a, uh, many comprehensive plan that if Grand Mount had a city within it, we would be doing a joint plan with them. So um, there's no city within it, so we're joint planning with ourselves. So this is a, a mini comp plan for the um, Grand Mount UGA. Does anybody else have anything on this particular topic for right now? A uh, couple questions. Who determines what the lot size would be? I heard some of the things when we looked at Olympia, we looked at some water, we looked at this other, but how did we come up with the figures that you did for lot size specifically? Go to yeah, that one. Okay, so what I did, and of course this is a proposal too. So you guys decided what I should be putting on paper eventually. Um, so what I did was I looked at uh, what are kind of the general sizes that are popping back up. Right. And a lot of that is the 50, the 40. Uh, and then, I, sorry, I had a lot more screens when I looked at this. Um, yeah. So it's easier for me to directly compare. So then, yeah, this one's good. So this is the current, and then this is just the draft proposal you have now on the red side. Um, so you see some like the flag lot, I don't decrease it because it's already at 20. And 20 was typically, a, I think, the only places that went much lower than 20 or maybe the Olympia UGA. I don't have stuff on here. Okay, what is a flag lot? A flag lot is where a general lot you go, you see it from the street, and it's all there. The whole width is there. A flag lot, you have a thin pathway and then you get to the lot back behind and maybe there's a lot right here. Got it. So it looks like the state of Oklahoma. Or a drive behind, behind the other house. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay. often like if somebody has a really long lot, okay. they'll split it into a flag lot and a hang on. So okay. we with flag lots, we don't want to uh go crazy with that because you have to have road access. Right. And Amelia Correct me if I'm wrong, but in general, we took a look at the same types of zoning uh, areas in our other UGAs. And what, yeah, thank you. Um, and what are we, what, what were we seeing there 
and then pulling that into the like um, types, lot types in the Grand Mount area, but also keeping in mind the public comments that we have received um, that there's a sense of place that they want a town feeling that we want to keep it a rural community feeling it set uh, as we were taking a look at those different lot sizes. Because I just, I mean, I just thought that if we have Olympia, Lacey, and Tomwater, which are the three of the largest cities in Thurston County. These are from their UGAs, right. and they are specifically residential zones with the same density levels. Right. So it's, I'm not looking at a high density area in a UG or anything like that. I'm looking at lower density in an urban growth area. So already so removed and then removed again. Have you looked, have you looked at the areas like uh, Rainier and Tonight Home, what, what theirs are? Um, Is there I'm more of a rural yes. city, or, you know? And I'm trying to think of a month ago when I made this chart. So we can go back and take a look to see how yeah. they compare against that and look at what zones they have. Because you got Grand Mound, which is a very small community like Rainier, like mm -hmm. tonight. But yet you're comparing it against the largest cities in Thurston County. That's my point. But it is important to note that I'm not looking at the general city limit zones. I'm looking at the UGA zone specifically. Right. Let's go back and take a look. All right. yeah. Commissioner Wheatley, you have more? Yeah. Oh, Commissioner Carmen, you had something? Um, Caitlin, you said that there's adequate supply of houses for the 20 year period. Mm -hmm. Does that take into account if, if some of this property is turned to commercial and, and everybody's talking about bringing in agricultural storage and all kinds of commercial stuff? Commercial industrial. Does that include the anticipated increase in population due to added? work at an employment the projections are based on um the projections are based on a build out so they're looking at both the employment growth for what's allowed there in the commercial and the industrial zones uh and what kind of um, population increase will come from those jobs um if we're talking about I'm not sure if I'm understanding the agricultural concerns correctly, but how I'm interpreting it is that the desire would be to have uses associated with agriculture, which would fit probably within the commercial and industrial zone, so we wouldn't have to change any zone in there. Um, we would want to maybe do some small calculations. In the memo, it, uh, it does um, mention how many housing units would be removed from those projections. Um, and so I would think that from there, it would just be a, a probably a quick calculation to figure out how that affects that percentage that I mentioned, that 18 to 25 for a, a good surplus of housing. Um, so we haven't done that yet, but that is something that we can do. Um, yeah. yeah Could I be interested in knowing what the projections are for employment? Increase the need for Nelson, did you have something? No, I was just going to say to Doug's question. The problem we're going to run into is if we make a change, like, well, like the fire station, if we take that from four to 16 to commercial, then not until after we're done is TRPC going to go in and read your numbers and figure out how that changes. And as far as, you know, we have the 22% number up there. And I mean, that's kind of a, obviously that's a guess. Um, I think the reason 18 to 22 is the right spot is because the growth management hearings board said 25 is acceptable. So that was, what that was, was basically what you have is you have this prop, all this property here. And you've got a plan, but you don't know what's going to happen to it. You know, there's take Grand Mountain, there's the gravel pits that are still active. If they're still active in 20 years, they obviously aren't going to develop to whatever their capacity is. So that's where that 22% comes in. Is we know that we've got this capacity here that's not going to get used, you know. Um, it's the same when you do the county, 
you look at a farm like mine, a problem, you know, it, if it's zoned one to five, probably there's a bunch of development there that's not going to get used. So you have to have your market adjustment or your market, I, I think they call it the market factor. Commissioner Levy, we leave you more. Uh, well, yeah. Um, well, one, I'm wondering just really briefly uh, as a question for you, Mr. Chair, um, could we, you know, on this ag thing, could we maybe have um, Stephen Bramwell from WSU Extension come in and just do like 15 minutes of sort of talking to us about how agriculture might use the use the zones that are within the UGA, like, you know, um, not the housing part, but the commercial part, like if, if he, if anybody would know sort of how this UGA would relate to the agriculture over there. Um, I don't, I don't I think imagine. that's a terrible idea. Oh, it's a terrible, oh, you don't, or you? I don't think it's yeah, a terrible Yeah, idea. maybe that would be very helpful. <laughs> but I mean, obviously we don't have subpoena power or anything, but we yeah, just- but we could certainly him. invite him. I'm yes. sure he would be. So we would have to work with uh, Stephen because he doesn't understand the land use world. Uh, yeah. So what we could do is we could work with Stephen and, and talk about you know, what are the things that he's looking for, the community is looking for from agricultural operations, kind of uses are they looking to site, and then take a look at our current zoning or what we've proposed for you all and where all that would fit yeah. in to that zoning that is all, you know, it all is accommodated or so we can do that. Um, yeah. I think it'd be helpful. Um, I, yeah, I think that's what Chris is talking about is probably the best way to go about it because one thing you have to think about is we can do all the zoning in the world, but somebody still has to come in and put in that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. you know? And there's a reason that there's tractor and seed and fertilizer dealers in Chehalis and not in Thurston County. And I don't know that there's, I mean, there are interested, and I know Tino's working on doing some stuff, but, uh, you know, if somebody wanted to come into Thurston County and do this stuff, there's really, I mean, I don't think there's things stopping them. Could you, other than, could you make the invite? Well, well, we can make the invite, and then, like I said, prior to that, we will sit down with Stephen and lay out what are those uses and how do they line up with the current zoning to those uses, because when you're actually asking him is for an online use analysis that he can't do. <laughs> okay, yeah, I don't know what I mean. I'm just asking for a chat with yeah. Stephen Bramwell, but yeah, so, if that's what it is. <laughs> you got something? Okay, how about, you know, no. Actually, I did have one thing. Uh, why did you go from nine different lot types just down to eight? Was there any? I, oh, why did I remove waterfront? Well, wh why are we still living, leaving it at eight? Why wouldn't we consolidate further? Well, it's, it's just a proposal. It's it's to get you started looking at it, looking at potential. If the other UGAs have two and three lot types, I wonder if yeah eight might be overkill. <laughs> that's yeah I that's why I looked at some of those and brought up the lot types um and so that's something what you guys think is best there are still other zone types residential types in Thurston County that do split it to eight okay I didn't see all of them have waterfront which was also and Grand Mount's not exactly known for its waterfront properties uh so I thought it might be one to suggest taken out but there are still other zones that do split it in. So it's, it still makes sense not to have all of them. Um, all we're showing you is the three, um, out of the three larger UGAs that make, that correlate the most. And I did want to pop back in on the Bifoda and Rainier. They don't have anywhere near the same density since they're so far off I-5. And uh, for several of their residential zones, there aren't minimum. There aren't minimum. Yeah. Or they're not split out 
in any similar fashion. But so that was a big part of it is if I looked at them, I'd be looking at one home per five acres rather than four to 16 for one. And it would be drastically opposed to what that zone type is meant for. Okay. I mean, it I would drive, work against. Yeah, I, run, I drive through right here in Spano all the time, and there's a lot of construction, residential yeah. construction going on right now. Mm -hmm. So they had to have had some type of uh, lot width or some type of zoning discussion. That's why I, I brought that. And I will go ahead and for the next meeting, I'll try to make up a list of all those two. Go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, I would I would like to put it in the record, yeah, you know, so that it gets into the um, the minutes that I had sent out a list of questions that's available. Um, I, I don't know if it would of, be. I think that goes in a part of public record in a yes. meeting packet that's listed. It should be on okay. The website. Yeah. All right. Um, and and in relation to that, I do have, you know, I'm I'm really interested in um, uh, how this UGA can help with two very current issues, one of them being the housing crisis. And, you know, from my perusal of the census data um, of the UGA tract and the sort of neighboring tracts that are similar to it, sort of going out to Bukota and, you know, going west to Rochester and you know, I think there's one little tract somewhere else too. But anyway, you know, the, the kind of the big picture that I took from just quickly perusing the 2020 data was that there is an affordable housing crisis in the south part of the county. Um, you know, we think of people being um, homeowners, but uh, over 25% of folks are uh, renters. And a certain percentage of them are those people who really, really, really struggle to pay the rent. And, um, you know, it takes a big part of their paycheck. A big chunk of people, um, I actually have the numbers, but, um, you know, a lot of people are making less than um, 50,000 a year. A lot of people are making less than 25,000 a year. And, you know, I would really, really love to see this UGA be partly about, uh, addressing the housing issues for these people. Um, I'm very interested in that. And so as part of that, I would love it if we could have some kind of an analysis that's census-based um, that is, incorporates the surrounding, you know, kind of feeder community, because really, you know, like when there were the workshops and everything, I mean, a lot of the people that were giving the input were people from the area, not from the UGA, right? And you know, what they were saying is they like, um, uh, you know, they're excited about the amenities, you know, having a, they would love to have another place to shop. They'd like to have enough density, you know, that there's a, a grocery store, there's a restaurant and so on that, you know, kind of adds to the amenities of the area. So there's that, but also, um, you know, there's this need again for, um, for more housing for people who are struggling to, to pay for it. And the other thing that I noticed from the census data was, um, and this goes to another crisis that we have, the climate crisis, um, that a lot of people spend a lot of time commuting out of these, this general region. And so, um, you know, a very large percentage in one census tract is over 50% have at least a 30 minute commute to work. Um, and, you know, surprising numbers, or maybe not so surprising, you know, even an hour commute just one way. So, um, you know, the other, you know, ideal for planners, of course, is that by um, building up the UGA, you might provide opportunities for people to be able to work closer to home and not have to commute. So you kind of help with the whole climate crisis, greenhouse gas thing too. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure how we do analysis about that, but um, that's why I kind of asked the questions in that list of questions that I provided, especially around HB 1220, um, because the legislature has made it really clear that it's really interested in trying to address the housing crisis and that they've, you know, they put stuff in that isn't required for us, right, because it's, it's previous to the passage of HB 1220. But I would love to see some of that incorporated anyway. 
I, because really, you know, that's that's what the legislature wants, and it's really um, what we want, I think. Um, right. So we will we'll take a look at housing that using the requirements under 1220 allows uh, your home to a comprehensive plan update for the entire county. Uh, it makes more sense to do that on a county basis instead of on a sub area or UGA by UGA basis. Um, so we'll take a look at that in our, our comp plan updates in 2025. So we'll start working yeah. on that. The other piece of that is that the um, guidance document that goes along with that wonderful bag law that they put together um, is just being now created by commerce. So yeah. to try and put it together at the moment with this particular UGA, um, okay, be extremely difficult. So we'll take a, a broader look at the county under 1220 um, during our conference plan update. But we are trying to make decisions. I mean, this goes very directly to decisions that we need to make. Like we need to think about, you know, do we want to support that high density neighborhood or do we want to allow, you know, high, you know, there's a proposal to have a higher density neighborhood outside the UGA and for us to expand it to allow that to happen. And those are questions we need to answer now. Um, and so I think it would at least be helpful to have some kind of analysis of, of needs um, that are relevant to to the kind of zoning that we're looking at and and how consistent we want it to be. Um, what? So, well, for instance, I mean, if we're looking at you know this firehouse and the other property that's within the the middle density zone, according to this map, and there's reasoning for having it there that's related to transportation, you know, multimodal access, congestion, you know, there's, there's all these overlays, right, that, that we're supposed to be considering when we're thinking about, well, why do we want to put it there and not, you know, over here on the, you know, on the west of the UGA? Why, why would we want to expand over there when we want to put it here? Why would we want to turn this into AC when it's where we want to put the dense housing? I mean, we have those kinds of questions before us. We have these eight things we need to look at that are very much related to what's the overall vision for this thing. And um, it would be helpful for us to be, or at least for me to be thinking about this when I understand um, what the needs of the larger community are, especially around housing um, and, and sort of how this fits into that. Because it seems to me like this UGA is the place where that multi, family housing and that low income housing is going to go, you know, what's really great about HB 1220 is that it is asking to have those facts before people who need to make decisions. So the House bill requires us to look at housing based on um, median income, not necessarily on what's needed or wanted in the area. And so that, that's, that's the difference. Um, so we can take a look at what happens if we remove uh, this particular four to six and change it to AC, um, but we're not, at the moment, we're not looking at, we're not doing an analysis uh, based on uh, income. Right, but we, as a planning commission, have a slightly different um, uh, mission because it's our job to be sort of, looking at this holistically, we have the permission to do that, I guess is what I'm saying. So again, we, can, we can do more, we can have the vaguer, broader conversations right. that you can't have. And I'm, that's why I'm asking the clarifying questions. I'm asking you, what is it that you want us to analyze? Um, I'd like to know, I would like some analysis of housing needs that's sort of based on 1220, you know, it's, um, you're supposed to sort of, uh, my understanding of 1220 is that there's supposed to be kind of some information developed about housing needs based on income levels. Um, you know, that, that there's supposed to be sort of a report provided as part of the planning process. And so it doesn't have to be anything super fancy, <laughs> yeah. but just even just like the, the, the tracts that are, you know, sort of from west to east that are kind of most, uh, relevant to the UGA, you know, just taking those and just doing some analysis of the housing needs. 
Okay, so we'll take a look to see at to see what we can what we can do. Um, but again, when you say housing needs, I we're trying to figure out just trying to figure out what the that I'm analyzing for. So we'll take a look at um, some of this. Okay. I, I just have a question about the details of this. If, when looking at income, median income, and housing needs, are we doing this on like a census tract basis? Because you mentioned just looking at this guidance that okay. is being developed by Commerce. That's why we are better off doing it at a county level when we do the comprehensive plan when update. We get the median income for the county, we don't get a real good right. idea of what's yeah. happening. In Grand exactly. But like I mentioned before, the census data that we have doesn't line up with the Grand Mount UGA. So we don't really have the information. Uh, okay, well, let me try to clarify. I don't only want to study the UGA because the UGA is a solution to, a, a, you know, how to best serve the South County. And one of those needs is that there's a lot of low income folks and that you know and if there's commercial development uh there's going to be even more need but we cannot you know as a as a planning commission we're allowed to think um more regionally about the purpose that the sub area serves so the region a, right when we have a rochester sub area plan which we completed in 2020 which is up there and now we're taking a look at our urban, our uh, the more urbanized area which is the grand mound uga so we'll take a look at some of the, this area uh, and bring some information back. But yeah, because my understanding, I mean, for instance, I mean, there's a direct relationship between this UGA and the Rochester sub area plan, because I think it's stated explicitly in there that one of the purposes of, the, is this, of this UGA is to help Rochester maintain its rural character by taking the population growth. And I think that's in some wording that's actually in the in the Rochester plan. And you can see that the, the brown area there is the most dense. It's the densest we have in any rural county. Right. So, yeah, I'm not arguing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One last request. You bet. Can we get a couple of these maps? Sure. One that shows with where you can see the main roads. And where what the existing zoning is, so we can see where the commercial is, where the res, current zoning for residential and whatnot, and then one that's the same size. And what would be the result if we approved all of these? So from an overlay, so that I can see how does it really change? The, so you want two separate, I, I'm just going to clarify, two separate two documents. Separate. One is, here's what it is today. Okay. You can see the roads, so you know where the main roads are, how they interface with, with what's there now. And then the, the proposed one, or the requested one, we'll call it, that shows the, the new stuff and you know, what it would look like in the zone, how it's sold. All right. Thank you very much. We are going to move. Thank you, Amelia and Caitlin. We are going to move on uh, to other business. Item number six on our agenda, which is staff updates. Do you have anything today? You don't have anything since you're in your staff update of introducing us to Amelia. Okay, we'll move on to item seven, which is our calendar. And uh, for September 21st, we're going to work on this Grand Mount sub area again. We're going to work on the um, capital improvement program and the boundary line adjustment code. And we are still having, we, we have a public hearing on the 21st. You have the public hearing on the CIP and the ELA, the boundary line adjustment. Yep. Yep. So we have public hearings for both of those two. Other than Commissioner Day, is anybody else planning on missing September 21st? Okay, we should have eight of us. On October 5th, we should be working on docket item A25, force conversions, and A18, the ag CAO. Um, is there anybody that's not planning on being here for October 5th? We should have a full house. Great. For item number eight, the good of the order, is there anything that anybody has for the good of the order? Well, with having no further business, the meeting is adjourned.